pattern recognition. And I want to get people to think about not only patterns as a basic structure of how we organize information, but the way that we can kind of focus on um, you know, how much human beings need patterns to be able to generate information and to create um, structures to interpret that information. So now, on one hand, the 21st century, we're seeing an eruption of different patterns. We're seeing, um, in economics, you call it disruption when you have new forms, like, say, for example, the iPhone or the iPad, um, that come in and disrupt previous economies of scale based on all sorts of things. Uh, mobility, communication networks. A lot of countries, are, like, say, for example, here in Africa or certain parts of Asia, whole chunks of the country are skipping out of the 20th century model of the landline, and almost nobody has a landline anymore. Or uh, that's just one example. Or another example for you know would be say for example in Paris where people are now riding bicycles because they're given away for free specifically within certain areas of the city. Um, those become disruptive patterns of the previous patterns. So one of the things that really um, kind of sticks in my mind with sound and environmental issues is how do we synchronize things? How do we understand? The idea is not only the term synchronicity, which is a pun about how, say, for example, um, Arthur Kostler, who's a writer, um, had this whole thing about ghost in the machine and stuff like that. Um, I'll just type that out really quick. I'm not a fan of his work so much, but I do think it has some really intriguing resonance. Um, so the police had a really funny rock album called Synchronicity. And of course, you can see the group. You're a huge police fan. I work with him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Sting's daughter lives in the she's cool. Um, okay, so synchronicity, the city as synchronic space. Now, the pun here um, is not only, I'm going to just type that city as synchronic space. Um, if you think about diachronic versus, syn uh, versus synchronic, um, you're seeing different forms of organizing time in the urban context. Now, the city, um, how do we organize time in the urban context versus nature? Um, so what I'm going to show is a couple examples, and I think Mitchell wanted to also, do you want to, should we start with you, with yours first, and then we'll jump You're in? You're saving all this so it's a PDF at some point? Yeah, it'll be okay. a PDF, and we'll have, by the end of today and early tomorrow, we'll, we'll give you everything, um, natural systems. So, how people organize experience is incredibly important in the 21st century. One could argue that we've now moved into what some economists call the experience economy. There's these two economists, uh, Pine and Gilmore, uh, who have a book called The Experience Economy, but I'm going to reference a little bit. Um, and so, when, when you think about the idea of the production of physical goods, it's something that drove the last several centuries of capitalist expansion. We're moving more and more into this idea of a post kind of material goods, but at the same time, a dispersion of how people think of the production process. So the, the chain of, say for example, if you get, look at your iPhone, it's made with parts from over 100 countries. Uh, your average pair of pants have moved through seven countries, statistically speaking, to before you even wear them. Uh, your pair of shoes that we're all wearing are made with materials that can easily be derived from over 10 different countries and then compiled maybe in the Philippines, Malaysia, China, and so on. So there's going to be some of the material that we're going to go through this afternoon and some of the material we're going to go through now to link not only production processes with how we consume experience, but also how experience conditions and contextualizes things. So I'm going to say conditions and context. Um, and so music, for me at least, is one of the few elusive materials because it's a material that is kind of malleable and it's one of the more elusive qualities of human expression, but it's also a mirror that we hold up to society. It's something that says, these are the production processes. If, if you're in the Middle Ages and you have wood and you're going to make you play a piano or a violin, or if you look at the, the invention of the saxophone, for example, uh, Adolf Sax was one guy who came up with the saxophone in 1840 and revolutionized music. Uh, but the funny thing is the first compositions for saxophone uh, were done by composers like WC. And now if the saxophone hadn't been invented, that tool, that device, uh, would not have had such an amazing trajectory. If you think about jazz, if you think about the way people kind of like Charlie Parker, uh, Miles Davis later on, not, not saxophone, but 
all sorts of you know people got into that one instrument. And so the instruments of our era are the digital media tools and the software that have slowly dematerialized the physical form of all the other instruments that we would have used in other eras. So say, for example, right now, um, I'm working with Apple on a couple of projects, and I'm just going to use this as its touchstone. Um, and I have, uh, my iPhone app just came out a little while ago, and so the DJ Spooky iPhone app was meant to be a kind of pun about the studio in your pocket. Um, and so, okay, so what I did was come up with a whole series of mixes, and I'll show you this just as an example, easily and quickly, just so we can kind of keep moving, um, of the dematerialized studio, just as a K. Uh, the, the here is what it does, is the, uh, it's the DJ Spooky iPhone app, what it does is it incorporates your iTunes library straight onto uh, your stuff in a way, um, that you can easily do beat detection and beat matching. So say for example, if I wanted to assign it to different channels, you do that, it loads a mixer, and then pops up and you're good to go. Um, and hold two seconds, and all right, so. Oh, two seconds, it's loading, all right, so. All right, let's say for example, I'm mixing a classical music song with an electronic. And I'm able to crossfade between the two very easily. And I'm just masking the visual. Alright, you guys can hear that? Now, I'm saying I'm going to do the same thing with beats. You know? And so, I'll just switch one up. So you're hitting a beat, right? And let's just. Aesthetic is visual, it's intuitive, and above all, it's about pattern recognition, which is what we talked about earlier. But being able to work with a major corporation like Apple and being able to kind of have the ecosystem or the network of the app store, we've had over a million downloads of, the, of this app. And so the DJ Mixer app came about from a series of conversations with Israeli software designers that I've been working with. So the app store to me is a kind of abstraction of an ecosystem. It's something that's completely dematerialized, it's global, it's a series of reference points. And the funny thing is, if I was to just call it up really quick to show you again how people use search engine terms to come up with software, there's no reference point. We didn't um, make any advertising, we didn't do anything, it's just strictly word of mouth and people are typing in uh, search terms. And so what I'm going to use this as a reference point for is how people search for information, organize information, and above all, um, the idea of the mix as a kind of uh, social sculpture that we can easily engage. So uh, after this, I'm going to pass it over to Mitchell. He's going to show you a couple of examples. Um, I can give you the. Um, you know, I, I, can I interject? One yeah, bit? sure. Because oh. I, I, you know, I think that the topic of pattern recognition is actually kind of fascinating. The idea that you can uh, instantly kind of move from some classical piece, to, you know, into some disco thing and, and do it on the fly and, and have any variation of your fingertips is the kind of society that we live in. And, and we've known this for, for, for some time. In fact, there's, a, there's an argument stemming from, from Borges where he talks about the, 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 the library of Babel. And, and there's this kind of traveler that moves through the library of Babel, which is infinite in size. In fact, it's a, you know, Borges says it's arranged in these octagon-like rooms. Anyway, as this traveler is looking at all the books in this library, uh, the, the individual realizes that all the books are similar. Not the same, but are similar. So if you were to pull out a book in this, this library of Babel, it would be, let's say, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Romeo and Juliet. And it would be uh, an edition where the, the period at the last paragraph of the entire, whatever, Act 3, is missing. The book next to it is exactly identical to that, but the period's in place with an added period. The book next to it is missing the period in the middle, but has a period at the end. In fact, when the traveler starts walking through it, he sees that there is every possible variation of Romeo and Juliet. And that takes about two millennia to walk through <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. We'd all be dust. Well, so, so if you think of a, 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 you know, a computer just like this, and you, you think of a picture that's uh, what? Um, uh, less than one megabyte of memory, right? And that's just made up of pixels 
let's say, a thousand or so pixels, you know, or maybe maybe two thousand, give it some resolution. You know that you could possibly have any image known to man already stored in this computer. The possibility. So you can have the Mona Lisa with a pink face, a Mona Lisa with a puce face, a Mona Lisa with a slightly less puce face. Every variation already exists. We haven't found it yet, but the possibility for it to exist is there. You only need about a couple of what, terabytes before you could have every possible variation in just a one megabyte frame. That's it. So it's it's not it's not the, the ability to have it. It's actually the, the ability to find it that becomes more important. The ability to seek, to search, that becomes a, kind of the potency. So we actually we write we write algorithms. Uh, I have a PhD in computation. We write algorithms to find these things, find out what's special about them, and extrude them outwards. It's not a kind of an evolution of you know this this story of uh, the monkey is in a room for infinity and uh, the monkey's typing on a typewriter. Will eventually the monkey type Shakespeare, right? Well, I guess if you have infinity, sure, the monkey will type uh, Romeo and Juliet. But that's kind of absurd to think that, that that kind of randomness is expected, right? You you actually can kind of uh, selectively pick off chunks of ideas. And, uh, well, I mean, this is getting into Dawkins and evolution, but you can selectively kind of choose where you want that monkey to go. And we we certainly have been able to do this when we start scripting algorithms. So. Uh, I don't, I don't want to spiral out of control, but, but uh, if you want to, if you want to do a, a, a write a program uh, to to do your accounting, let's say a very simple a, a, a accounting for your taxes, and, and this one procedure that works in a, a single cell, it takes about the, the finest mind took about 38 lines of code to write this simple thing that does this accounting procedure. Well, if you dived into this primordial soup of every possible string of code, right and not a human writing it, but a hunter-seeker algorithm. Go inside there and it can actually find that piece of code and write it in 11 lines as opposed to 35. And you can stare at it and say, well, I'm not sure how that works. But if you allow this hunter-seeker to continue to move, you'll actually find that after about a, a couple of weeks, it, uh, it produced a, a string of code that's only five lines in length. That does the same thing that a human took 38 lines to write. A human can stare at it and it's not really sure how it's functioning with the machine. It's actually performing at the same level. So actually, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that at some point, there's a kind of a, uh, what, what would be the? Optimization. Yeah, optimization. Uh, I wouldn't say optimization. It's like a, a kind of a, a advanced understanding or feedback of, the, of, the of, of, of the impossible. Uh, a better, another root note. Jimi Hendrix, what made him different from other musicians is he was playing with infinity. Right? He would play a guitar and get feedback, but he couldn't control the feedback when it started off. He could control it when he heard it, when he responded to it. And that made him the kind of musician that he was, is by listening to that feedback, responding to the loop, and then playing off of that loop. So uh, you know, this is the same thing when we're approached with the infinite possibilities in anything we're doing in any form of image making or music making. It's just this understanding that you are seeking something. Uh, uh, you know, Wolfram, and his, uh, what is it called, reality engine is based on this premise. He said, you know, when I had a conversation with him years ago. He said, you don't need to write any piece of music. Wolfram Music has every piece of music you can ever, pop, if we can go to his website, every piece of music that has ever been invented and ever will be invented exists in my Wolfram engine. Well, so he came up with that idea 30 years ago. Yeah, so it was a, a top, who had it? The, the, it was well, his top people. Theory. Yeah, but I was just, just like stoned off my ass. And no, but he, 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 built, he, he built this system, so cool. it, there's reality engine, but he has a website, uh, Wolfram Music. So you can basically find any piece of music that, is, that has existed before, and you can make a variation on that piece of music to anything. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, his, his kind of prediction is, is it's kind of, eventually the human is, about the, is learning about what the response is, whatever that is, and kind of folding it into something else. But then, of course, that, that adds another layer of feedback. Once the, the machine response comes makes to an acid code, essentially. It kind of, it it's, 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 on it's Godel, Escher, Bach, right? Yeah, Godel, Classic, Escher, Hofstetter, uh, recursion systems thing. We're kind of stuck in that. You know? Sure. But the, the, recur the idea of recursion That's a logic. Yeah, I think the common denominator we're seeing here is when I was working with Apple to come up with a kind of commercially applied idea about mixing, we wanted to give people the tools to be able to mix their own iTunes library. 
So the fun part about figuring that out was, okay, how many millions of people have this archive of their own taste? And I didn't want to make something that was kind of, here's your DJ Spooky mix. What I was to say was, these are tools that we can then give out as, as a free app. So what we did was, we did, the first one was 99 cents, and we sold a lot of that, and we made it free, which made it even more exponential. And the search engine term, like the way people drive to through iTunes and the way that they search for songs and so on, my app kept coming up. So we ended up having the, the, the search term DJ plus mixer. And a lot of people kept going. I mean, it's, it was, we had a million plus downloads of DJ Mixer about a couple weeks ago. Now we're at a million, two, almost 200, 1,200,000 downloads or something. Some, my, the guys who are maintaining the site are just saying it's this huge exponential. And I haven't lifted a finger for promotion or advertising or anything. So what you're saying here is that we're seeing an algorithmic society. And that's one thing that whether it's Google <coughs> or whether it's Google, the people are using the software to pull apart the ideologies that have driven the economy of the last several centuries, the idea of the knowledge economy. Uh, now we're moving to the, the wealth, instead of the wealth of nations, you now have the wealth of networks. So the network effect here is what we're going to be talking about both in art, literature, and the environment. So with that said and done, I want to pass the, the, the VGA cable over to uh, Mitchell, <laughs> and we're going to just jump in his uh, laptop for a second. But um, I'll, if anybody's interested, in, I can do more demos of the apps and mixes and show you. And that's the CDs I gave you guys, by the way, are all meant to be DJ tools. They're meant to be sampled and you, they're open, you know, Creative Commons. Uh, feel free to rip, mix, and burn. Um, and I, sh I can assure you, no one on those CDs will sue you. Um, so um, the pun here is we're looking at not only how at the edge of human experience right now, the 21st century, I think we have immense possibility and immense destructive capability at the same time, which is eerie and weird. Like, you know, the oil spill in one metaphor, but also the fact that we're now creating artificial life on the other. You know, these are two eerily resonant moments in human history. Um, the okay. largest disaster in human history and the largest and most incredible, you know, scientific advances in human history simultaneously. Those are something that really linger in my mind. Um, but, yeah. yeah. And we're also in this transitional generation. If you want to define yourself, on what, it is, what, what exactly it is that represents the now, uh, it's certainly extremely potent. Uh, I mean, there, there are many meta themes, environments, one of them. I'm going to talk about that. But this idea of kind of uh, recursion uh, and, and everything has been done, and we can do it again and again and again, uh, is, is so prevalent. But, you know, uh, Paul was talking about tools, and we actually had this, we began this discussion of tools, I guess. Uh, the last time it banned, we didn't quite, kind of finish it. I mean, we're in a generation where we actually learned how to paint, right? Or draw, or sculpt, or use clay, or, uh, you know, I don't know, make models. I, you know, I teach a generation of architects that, well, they never did that, or they did it in kindergarten, right? And they forgot, they don't care, because you can do it in a computer that simulates these things. And then you can kind of play off the simulation of clay making off of the clay making and you get to something, you know, that seems even funkier. But you've lost that kind of original purpose. A lot of these tools that we use in the computer are totally taken, from, move, taken back from the Middle Ages. Uh, perspective. Perspective, which is, yeah, it, it's uh, Brunelleschi, uh, who had made, who made, made these machines looking at churches, clipping hither and yons. And none of this is done, or Euclid setting up his, his, his geometric models. All of this is just taken for granted in, in computational systems. And they force us into these, these boxes, but uh, without knowing how you got there. And maybe that's not important anymore. Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, but uh, because it, it, it's going to breed this new, new group of folks that are going to be able to do things and, and see things a lot quicker. Uh, right down to the, I guess, the edges. Maybe just click the next slide. Uh, I'm going to use the term carborexic. It kind of describes a, this kind of summation of this talk, uh, carborexic cities specifically. And I guess because we've got a kind of intimate group here, uh, would anyone want to take a stab at is it opening again? What, what carborexic might mean? Uh, starving of carbon. Right. Starving of carbon. We're going to wean ourselves off of this carbon society that we're in. Absolutely. We've got to think about how we're going to do that. I don't think that it's going to come through. Uh, forcing people to change uh, their, their kind of value systems, right? I, I, I use Homer Simpson as the average American. In fact, that's, in fact, that's a really bad statement. There's no such thing as an average American, 
Americans never think of themselves average no matter where they are. They're always some kind of a you know, feeling of a speciality, right? Or this, this kind of culture of uh, I'm special and therefore you know, I'm not average and I don't want to necessarily change my ways. In fact, if we start telling Americans to change their ways because what, the, you know, the sky is falling or because you know, fuel is leaking out of the Gulf of Mexico or because some scientist somewhere did a core sampling uh, and has discovered that there, there's actually uh, you know, not only ozone depletion, but temperature changes, et cetera, et cetera. You start telling Americans to do that, 50% of them, those that voted for Bush, instead of changing their behavior, uh, are going to absolutely take on a very different tact. In fact, what they're going to do is, is, is they're going to buy the biggest possible car you can imagine, right? Put as much fuel in as they can, buy the biggest possible house, and speed up and down and live life to the extreme. Right? Because we're all going to die, they want to go out in a giant you know, flash as opposed to slowly dying off by weaning themselves off of carbon. So it takes the exact kind of opposite effect. If you tell uh, the people to start driving electric cars, and we've done that before, okay, well they've got some issues with that, and there's a ton of them going to talk about them. Uh, we did that in, uh, with um, uh, Tom Hanks and uh, General Motors and Ford put out a series of these cars. Anyway, Tom Hanks went on TV and says, I drive an electric do it here in California. And he's talking to Jay Leno. He's saying these things are great. Anyone can use them. Okay. Anyone can use them. So why, why, just go to this one. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, any, 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 anyone can use them. Anyone can use them. So uh, why did Americans right, suddenly go out and buy electric cars? What, what was kind of the thought behind that? Well, one of, one of the things is that when you start thinking about value systems and resyncing people's value systems, and you go to Hollywood, because they're popular, people tend to follow whatever Leonard DiCaprio is doing or Tom Hanks or whatever. Uh, it's a good idea, right? At first, as many people will start buying into that trend, but at the same time, it also distances, this is Harold Laswell, right, a psychologist, also distances those folks who don't feel comfortable with, in this case, Hollywood. If, if Tom Hanks is driving an electric car, right, he's Tom Hanks. He's special. He's important. Of course he could drive an electric car. I'm not as important, or my life isn't as so, you know, whatever, in, in, uh, you know, in the spotlight or, or, or glamorized. I, I can't drop one of these things. So there's always a kind of contradiction when you're fighting for values. So I leave it up to, the, the, to us, thinkers, designers, doers, makers, to go almost behind the scenes and change the very kind of nature or the essence of the things that we produce to be green. Green not as a radical proposition, because it's a joke if you think green is radical at this point. Uh, the revolution is over with, we won, it's a mainstream idea, it's kind of accepted, so there's no point in trying to be radical about it. I think that green is kind of a, a it's just a, it's a very important constraint. And that's kind of how we approach it. So it's through design, through these kinds of acts behind the scenes, we can kind of change the society. So Homer Simpson can live the way he wants to live, drink duff beer, drive back and forth in his car, but the car itself, the underneath it, like underneath that skin, is a very different vehicle that behaves different on many, many different levels and certainly fits into an economy that respects the earth. So th this slide, I think, sums up the entire sustainability debate, which is a word that Bill McDonough and I and many others don't like. Uh, but, but it sums it up in kind of this, this kind of one little image. And this is by this uh, artist called R. Crumb, uh, kind of really depressing, you know, slightly, his brother was suicidal, really, I, I love him, but glib human being. And, 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 and the environmental debate that he sees, and, and I completely agree, is basically these three meta themes. The first one is zero, which is the end of the world, or eschatology, the apocalypse, that uh, you know, when a scientist gets up and says, you know, uh, it, because of my studies in the polar ice caps, uh, in 50 years from now, the temperature will be radically changed on Earth. We're all going to die. Uh, support my research so we can change this thing. Uh, you know, it's a, also there's a doom saying, uh, you know, many uh, breeds all sorts of skeptics, etc. I don't think that the end of the world scenario is even worth a topic anymore when it comes to discussion of green or a discussion of sustainability or whatever you want to talk about. It's just it's not, not, not necessarily going to get us anywhere. Not that I, I don't understand things like Viorello and, and conditions of the accident and the philosophy behind the end of the world and eschatology. Those are potent. But the more of kind of an academic position. The, the one and two uh, areas, I think, are, are super important. And that's kind of the technological fix. 
uh, which is what I went over with before, which is this idea of geoengineering or through some massive feat of science, and there is entire libraries filled with inventions that could save the world, right? We just don't use them all, but it, it's, it's been there, it, it is around. The techno fix seems to be a, a strong, strong uh, a residual theme whenever we discuss issues of, of the environment sustainability. So it's, it's still there. And it's these kinds of propositions or fantasies of the future that I also like. Uh, and then uh, number two, the ecotopia. Now this is the kind of return to the vernacular, return to the ways and traditions of man, return to the beginning, becoming at one with nature. Everything that we need to know has already been given to us by God, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm saying God for a specific reason. But it's already there. And we need to find pieces of nature as they are, without any further real manipulation, and dwell or kind of create a human condition that is in, in deep harmony with, the, with this kind of ecotopic environment. Uh, it's also kind of an extreme position. I do believe that the work that we're doing at Terraform, and the work that probably maybe some of you are doing, probably falls more in the lines of one and two. And I hope you can kind of extract the zero thing. So now I think we're gonna, we should get into the value systems and what exactly they are. And they're, 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 they are uh, you know, the, the white picket fence and my house in the suburbs it is a dream. How do you fight a dream? You can't, necessarily. In fact, you've got to embrace it and roll with the punches. But these are the, the things that we're doing. We're, we, we suffer from this, this affluenza, this nonstop overdevelopment at all scales, right? From the doorknob to the democracy. In the United States, it's just, it's, it's a part of what we want to do. We actually, I, I, at some level, I, I embrace all of these. I want to live in a big fucking house. I want to drive a giant car. And I want to eat everything I can possibly eat, <laughs> right? But you know, I, don't, I don't want to get fat, and I don't want to damage the environment. But those are my values. You can take the greenest person on Earth, maybe that some, well, not anyone here specifically in this room, you take a real tree hugger, stick them in a room, and you secretly ask them, would you like to have three brand new Ferraris or, you know, one Civic? <laughs> and they'd be lying to you if they said they wouldn't take the Ferraris. I mean, that's not in all cases. There'll be some super nut that won't take the Ferraris. But somehow that's been ingrained in us is thinking that this is part of our value systems. So de-learning that is a, is a long-term task. It's something that can happen. So uh, the work that I did for my uh, dissertation uh, was, falls in this new field called uh, eco-transology. It's kind of the position between the city, the meaning of the city, Ecology as a science, as an act, uh, also in influences into social ecology, etc. And then mobility. Uh, and, I, you know, and I certainly know ecotransology is a, a very new field, because I'm pretty much the only one in the field, so I'm positive it's new. But the, the work that we've been developing at Terraform uh, has been uh, tantamount to kind of uh, explain this and, and, and kind of reifying it in various different forms and getting into the deeper positions. You have a question. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask, do you think that, uh, because you sort of quoted as the American sort of uh, ideology, the American dream, uh, so to speak, but would you trace that back to something earlier? I mean, if you look at, um, you know, uh, aristocracy, for instance, I mean, these are people who had the giant mansions, had, you know, the horse and carriage and had multiple yeah. servants. And it was, it's, it's almost seems to me that it's been a dream since the beginning of recorded history that someone would dominate over someone else and be able to take a huge amount of the resources and then you know, subvert the others. Uh, I, I, I certainly can trace it back. Uh, and in fact, uh, Murray Bunchin, social ecology, can make a very good point about doing that. And dealing in RNS, uh, also deep ecology, will make another point about that. But uh, it, it, it is American, it, regardless of how we got to it. It's certainly something that we embrace now. Well, well, manifest destiny. Well, well, manifest destiny is a great one. Gobble take. I would actually push it back to very fundamental biology issue. Uh, you, you get a petri dish full of sugar and water, throw some yeast yeah. in it, they will eat all the yeast and die off. And that's just, it's a biological thing. They, any, yeah. any, uh, any system will naturally uh, use all of the available resources to itself within its own uh, ecological niche until it yeah. hits the limits of its niche, and then it either goes into a symbiotic relationship with the other creatures within that system or it goes into a, a catastrophic catabolic yeah. collapse. It's a big point in evolutionary biology and Darwinism. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll make a kind of counter argument to that. I think it's a, it's a very good point. But you may have heard the story of the uber wolf versus Joe the wolf. 
And the Uruga wolf is this kind of this genetically bred wolf with super sharp teeth. He's incredibly handsome. Right. Right. And he's, he's in very fast, uh, faster than all the other wolves. Right. And he finds rabbits really quickly, eats them up, uh, brings them back, sleeps with all the female wolves, and starts producing children just like him. Big teeth, really good looking, right. running around, uh, capturing all the rabbits. Right. Until eventually there's no rabbits left. And then what happens? The den, the pack of wolves dies off. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, but, but there's a counter position, which is Joe the wolf, which is not the best looking wolf, not the sharpest teeth, not so quick, pretty good at hunting, but not the best. And Joe the wolf kind of only gets so many rabbits, keeping the status quo, keeping that state of equilibrium. That wolf becomes the most attractive to exactly. other partners as opposed to the uber overly oh, egotistical. It also fits with Nash's uh, theory of attraction. Right, but however, you know, there's a lot of counter arguments to this depending on the level of intelligence of the creature, etc. It needs to be much different than. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I was just simply saying that I think the structure, the fundamentals that drive this are not like Lynn Margulis talking about yeah. uh, how we're fundamentally very similar to bacteria. Our sense of uh, movement, our uh, encompassment. We move towards like food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, well, we, we, we would take this, this uh, very seriously in the position of the city. We do trace this back sometime to early versions of the American dream. I'm going to, for the sake here, I'm going to just go back uh, 102 years to King's Dream in New York, which is also a big kind of social ecology experiment here. The point being, though, is that uh, it's all envisioned by one single author. That the field of urban design, the field of architecture and urban design, knows for a fact that you can author design. It's absolutely possible to author design. It is not possible to author urbanity. Urbanity is not something you can go in, make a statement, and necessarily expect it to happen. No matter how much you think you can engineer it, it's not true. So these, these visions, uh, as we're gonna start from the past, getting into the future, are looking at variations in the city under this, this, this single rubric of, of, of authorship, that you can kind of look at the holistic picture and move the city towards issues of the environment, towards issues of mobility, towards a, a better kind of democracy. So, uh, and, and the point is that it's nothing new. So a lot of the research that I've been doing in, in ecotransology and, and the work that we have been doing since then kind of proved this. So here you can see uh, dirigible systems docking into skyscrapers that connect to elevator cores, that connect to bridge systems that go from skyscraper cluster to skyscraper cluster to a whole system of horses and buggies and pedestrians separated from the ground plane moving in this kind of future city. Right? It's all thought of at once through, the, through these one drawings. So what, what I do and what we do in Terraform is we design the entire freaking city, every component. And we do that from the top level, but respond from the bottom level. We do that algorithmically, we do that socially, we do that in all levels. There are other versions of this here, Santella, La City Novia. Here, this, this entire view of the city was done under this discipline that all motion would be made into a spectacle. That movement would become the, the chief aesthetic in the city. We'll extrude escalators, we'll extrude elevators, and that becomes a kind of driver for how this city was designed. Not necessarily the, the, the best driver, but one that's certainly there. Uh, Raymond Hood, here thinking about, you know, getting into the future, thinking about connecting bridging or movement systems with housing systems. You live on a bridge, kind of, uh, uh, kind of a hyped up Ponte Vecchio. So homes uh, are, are on bridge systems, and they move into skyscraper clusters and skyscraper clusters, getting this kind of ridiculous critical mass of mobility and huge, huge densification, intensification, and population, which is kind of a, a, a view of the city. Uh, Futurama, Norman Belgades, some of you might have known who this guy is. He, and I'm not going to unpack all this at the General Motors Pavilion that was done at the World's Fair, but essentially what he was looking at was the idea of streamlining. Through the act of streamlining, through his aesthetic act of streamlining, thought if you, you put fins on cars, if you put you know, pointy noses on trains and, and buses and airplanes, and buildings got you know, turned into airfoils, and you, you, you change the size of highways to be super big, that you would remove congestion. Right? Everything would move much, much faster. We would solve our big environmental issues because there wouldn't be cars parked you know, just doing nothing. Uh, interesting perspective, kind of a one-liner, but uh, it, it, it's, it's still resonant today where we think that everything needs to be kind of streamlined. Uh, here, escaping Nazi Germany, Hildesheimer, 
thought of inventing cities from scratch. And this was good to see the Manhattan, uh, Manhattan Project. Manhattan. Yeah, Manhattan Project. It's, it's absolutely uh, something that we don't teach in the academy per se. Is how do you think of a city, especially a place like Manhattan, uh, designed from scratch? When would you ever do that? Especially in this day and age, where almost no part of the earth hasn't been affected by, by humankind. Well, it, it, it does happen when you confront when you confront something like uh, being the planner for Hiroshima, being the planner for New Orleans, being the planner for uh, what just happened in Haiti. So there is a point to rethink cities from scratch, where you wipe out what was there before, understand there's kind of a tabula rasa, and then replace it. So here he's replacing it with this munificent ring roadway. Lots of parking and slabs and housing, almost a kind of a wicked, disturbing view of Manhattan. Uh, yeah. I'm just Brasilia. Um, Brasilia. Brasilia, 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 Brasilia,
for the wingspan of B-52 bombers, so you can land a squadron anywhere in the United States, deploy troops and tanks. So that was that was done before the kind of the, I mean, it was during the time of the atomic era for sure, but it wasn't necessarily later on the, the issue of uh, moving nuclear missiles came, came about from the Soviets, which was a project called the Disturbanists, which I'm, I'm showing a bit. Which is why every five miles you need a straight, a straight way. Right, it was a straight way. But the, 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 this, is, this has also been denied by the, the United States government. Uh, of course. But John Stilgo, uh, professor of mine at Harvard, who's a landscape architect, has since kind of disproven their denial of it. But whatever the case is, there's, there's certainly a lot of truth to it. It's, a, it's also how we separate the purple, uh, the red and blue states today, the Democrats, the Republicans, the city folks from the rural communities. That's kind of the, the bad, bad version of what happened with those highways. Here's a, here's a landscape architect, uh, Jellicoe, thinking about a very incredible thing. Here he's reversing the figure ground. So he's taking the background, the foreground, and changing them in cities so that the, where, where streets used to be, he's putting in buildings. And when they're, where the buildings uh, existed beforehand, right, now they're in the streets, he put in this green space. So this is kind of interesting. It's called Motopia. So what do you guys see in this green space? I know it's, it's, it's really dark. What do you see happening in that green space? Mm -hmm. well, this looks like they're open uh, kind of fields. Open fields, yeah. What, what are they doing in the open fields? Oh, they look sort of like, you know, Olmstead style parks with, with uh, I don't know, for roading it out and with no agriculture or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, it doesn't look agricultural. Right, okay. So it's just for recreation. They exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Not like, you know, to enjoy the view, maybe go sailing, play, frisbee. So the idea here is that you probably want productive green spaces, dealing with waste, food, water, air issues, energy issues. That would be a much better version of it. But here, we're not thinking about that. Then you see a sectional view through these new buildings. Mm -hmm. You see that the cars, these clunky, shiny metal objects, are on top. Where the <laughs> nicest views are, where the best orientation is, where the kind of the best air quality put the cars are. So that was right. And some of you may be familiar with these guys. In the 60s, lots of drugs. They decided to just, in this, this conceptualization, make cities walk, right? Archigram, huge fan of their work, probably third generation Archigram cells. But this is, this is also kind of a, a riff on the future, what the future might be if you combine mobility, ecology, and city together. Uh, and then kind of t built versions of it here. I don't know why these slides are so dark, but we're in a city in, Ch in Chicago. Here you have a multimodal station, boats, Right? Yachts park underneath it, you, cars park inside the skyscraper, and then you dwell above it. So these, I, these fantasies early on actually have become real versions of connected mobility systems and architectural systems all, all together once. Here's a, okay, another version we're getting now, now we're in the 70s. Uh, this is by Paul Rudolph. What he's doing is he's thinking of uh, a spine-like city. A spine that everything's going to happen in this one kind of line. And, and what's special about this is that he's created these in, uh, inclines for light, air, and view, so the, the kind of the, the surfaces are canted to get in the most, uh, you know, the most uh, views and the most appropriate things you want for orientation. And he's got uh, autonomous vehicles, light rail systems, and this whole spine moves over the Lower Manhattan Expressway all the way back into another skyscraper cluster. Again, these mm -hmm. thoughts of intensifications. The entire city designed by one author. You can get the, the the design part, but not necessarily the urbanity. I'm wondering, see that building over there, in the, the last one? Uh, like, you see the road next to it, the, the white road. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, hang on. This right road. road. Yeah, yeah. Now, now go up there. Now, see the the next street up. Then you hang on right and go about nine blocks over. Who are the poor bastards who have to live there? That's what I'm They don't get to live in this beautiful like that. Yeah. I, I, well, I think that's existing. That's, uh, yeah, are you going to show some of this stuff in terms of uh, urban design that uh, Robert Bosch was, because uh, that was really, oh, okay. Uh, well, we, uh, we certainly could bring up Yeah, let's talk about it maybe later. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a huge, huge figure. I mean, it's impossible not, not to, to discuss. I mean, the Jane Jacobs, Robert Moses thing, you know, we'll get into. Uh, well, now moving into the 80s, we've got actual technologies that, that, that they can switch the flow of traffic here, the zipper contraflow, actually changes the Jersey barrier, di Jersey barrier distances, so that you can move uh, congested traffic over to the side, create larger pathways so things can move around. Now this is this is actually you know very real, very simple to do, but for some reason it took a long time to get to it. And the things that we work on actually are, are based off of these off-the-shelf kind of uh, 
existing technologies and make them work and get to the future quicker. Uh, like this, this is something called an automated trans car, right? This is a, basically a vehicle that leaves the realm of the elevator core, moves throughout the building, which is pretty funky. So it gets, moves throughout the building and enters a new elevator core. So this, this creates a whole different kind of set of solutions you can think of when you design skyscrapers, actually any kind of building. And if you think of the Enterprise in Star Trek, uh, maybe all of you are familiar with it, how the hell does Captain Kirk get on a, you know, an elevator in the bridge and then move through the ship to go see Scotty in the back. Right? Okay. You know, that's very curious. So these, these, tra these automated trans cars do allow the, the kind of the architecture to respond to new feats of mobility and, and intelligence. Okay, now minority report. This is the last part of this, this survey here. So for those who don't like history, you really should like history. But minority report is a project uh, that looks at all these systems in one, one kind of synthesized version. Uh, my advisor, Bill Mitchell, was hired by Spielberg to think of the, uh, this particular movie. And he, he, actually, they put a lot of smart people in a room together, and Spielberg came in and said, we're going to do this movie with Tom Cruise, and uh, you know, it's going to take place in Washington, Washington D.C. in the future. Right? And, and uh, I want you guys to tell me what the future of Washington, D.C. is going to be like. And, and Bill stood up and said, oh, that's easy. Can I have my check? And Spielberg's like, okay, here's your money. You know, well, what's it going to be like? And you know, he starts walking out the door. He goes, DC, in you know, 50 years from now, is going to be exactly the same. That <laughs> 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 walks out. So he said, well, okay, well, let's think about what it should be and start telling me what that might be. So here we've got uh, Transelvators, strange name, but it's elevators that are part of infrastructure and architecture all at once omnidirectional maglev vehicles on strip systems so the vehicles can spin on a dime, move in, in the X, Y, and Z axes, and the infrastructure, the architecture, and mobility are all connected. So at MIT, I was a part of, uh, there was about 10, 14 of us thinking about the car of the future. It was my job for four years, uh, to think of the car of the future and what that might mean and how it would affect the city. So what was interesting about that is that we actually didn't want to design yet another car of the future. It was pretty soon. Pretty soon you'd forget about it. No one would care. Ten years from now, it'd be really, you know, anachronistic. It'd be kind of a joke. I mean, every car of the future you see is easily forgettable. So we thought about uh, a whole lexicon of notions that would fit into any idea of, of cities and mobility. And uh, for, for two years at Harvard, you can go back, uh, thinking about the notion of ecology in infrastructural systems, right? The environment affects the city, especially when it comes to the idea of roads. Uh, this is something that you can do in Europe a lot, and I've seen them all over, I've just been in Germany. But you have a bridge designed, not for human use, not for the drama of the human will, but for, uh, for animal species, to connect the mosaics in the landscape. So that one side can mate with the, the folks on the other side, keep that gene pool going. You do this with water-based culvert systems for alligators, crocs, and, and kind of fish, or the highway or any road systems affecting a water-based system. Here are boreal creatures. So you have trees that kind of interfere. In this case, bats would go over. And this is a photo that I got from Canada, where it was actually one of these things in use. It wasn't meant to be in use. Uh, you know, those elk are crossing to mate with elk on the other side. Uh, but you know, I think it's, you know, it wasn't intended to be used for that. It's for eight that real? So the elk actually was just used the highway? Yeah, they, they used the highway to cross over. <laughs> there they are, kind of marching on the side. Yeah, we, because uh, right where I live, I mean, I pass those bridges all the time. We have both underneath and over top. Um, and I, a close, well, um, father of a friend of mine uh, studies the environmental effects of these things, and he refers to those as bear and wolf buffets. Um, because the predators have actually become smart enough to know that those are the crossing points and that the, the animals will come to those places yeah. okay. and will eat the animals so, as they try to go by. Okay, because we're here and we're doing learning. Uh, well, we, we designed those bridges. And the way they're designed is called the hourglass configuration. So you have a predator-prey relationship. You got this kind of system plan. That's the bridge. The idea is that if there is a deer here, the deer has the sight line, right? Or it can walk over here and can see what's on the other side. So the view, right, as much of a view as possible to see if there's a fox or any kind of predator on the other side before it crosses. It's much, much different than a bottleneck 
or just a straight moving system. It's also good for the foxes because they're always curious because they can't really tell what's on either side. So they're always going to want to cross because they, they know there might be a deer here just out of sight. But, you know, it's like, oh, not a deer here. It's, you can't see over that particular area. So actually you can design those bridges so that, and you can put stump lines inside there, which is just little, um, you know, cut, cut tree parts so that uh, field voles or rabbits or smaller uh, uh, fauna will actually use them and don't feel that they'll be inside of uh, uh, avian-based predation. So there, 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 there are ways you can convince animals that's a great idea to cross it and, and you do it. There, there's so many of them in Germany, I'm so happy there are almost none in America. Mostly in places like Florida or Minnesota, where there's a lot of car accidents because you hit deer or something like that, and that's how we justify it. But it actually, it's, it's so necessary to connect the landscape that way. Okay, so our suppositions on mobility. We decide to, um, yeah, well, this movie will play. Maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, so, uh, by the way, do we get these PowerPoint presentations with the PDF? Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Do you want, uh, Mister? Do you want to make this available to everybody? It just depends uh, whether or not we take notes. Or, or I, too much. You know. I, I, I can't make all of this available because yeah. it's it's IP, okay. and uh, you know there's some patents and stuff. I'm just the history stuff in certain sections. Yeah. Do you want me to compile from the the file that you left on my desktop some stuff for me to download to the PDF or write it? Yeah. Yeah. We can tell you what. Later today, um, when we reconvene after lunch, we'll have a PDF of some of the uh, examples and things like that. Uh, can I, how do you, just hit the space bar, uh, I can probably play one of these movies, where's the, uh, okay, so let's see if we can do it from here. Or just click double click on it, yeah, there you go, there you go. Okay, so we actually didn't want to design a future car, we want to design, redesign the wheel, uh, and we did, and we redesigned the wheel so that everything that makes up the car is inside the wheel, so drivetrain, suspension, motoring, a modicum of intelligence, all inside one wheel. You add two, three, four of them together, you get a car, right? So this can go to any manufacturer anywhere in the world, and you basically rethink the vehicle based on one particular system. So not only did we do this one, we did, uh, and it's a file to factory print. So the whole thing is digital. You print it with a water jet cutter, and out comes your wheel. Uh, you know, this, is, uh, this is the version of, of the uh, what we call the zero car, which is the same thing, but there's no mechanical linkages in this particular system. In fact, the, the, the zero car is a, is, is a drive-by wire. It's a drive-by wire system, so, so you, you can kind of just say where you want to go, and off it will go, or it's a kind of Facebook on wheels, it just knows where your friends are. And it's completely omnidirectional, just like in Minority Report, the thing spins on a dime. So that, that's uh, retro. Kind of showing that it's a drive-by-wire system, so it's a very, very, it's a much different way of thinking about cars. In fact, is this the PowerPoint? Yeah. In fact, it's 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 fi finally accepting that the American city, the 20th century city, uh, has been designed for. Uh, is it? Oops. I always roll my PowerPoint back. Uh, just okay. Oh, I'm on So, so we want to, instead of cities, right, designed around cars, every city in the 20th century has been designed around the car, the crappiest thing you ever want to design something around. So that's, a, that's, that's basically what happened in America. We want to design a car to fit the city, a technology specifically made for a context, and that's what all these kind of projects are. And the big, the big kind of, uh, kind of the, you know, statement of intent was the form follows frequency. That's all about making these cities smarter to relate to these particular vehicles. So adding a modicum of intelligence can radically reshape how we think about the city. I'll give you a, a good example. What is the calculation? What is the kind of textbook? What is the kind of uh, 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 place you go to, authority, system authority, that you go to when you want to park in any city on the planet Earth, especially in America? What, what, what do you refer to? How do you park? What are the rules of parking? Find a space. Okay, find a space, yeah. Well, what's that called? What do you, what do you, tell us about, how do you find a space? What's the, what's the calculus you use to find a space? Are you talking about physical, like the way we walk into a room and just judge, like spatial dimensions? No, I'm talking about physical and spatial dimensions. 
Uh, there's I mean, it's called proprioception. Um, Proprioceptive feedback. Yeah, feedback. Yeah. But uh, or, 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 sorry, I, what I do is I go to where I want to be and then I spiral. Okay, that's a that's a pretty good answer. Start closest, start looking, and spiral out till you find something. Oh yeah. And I have incredible parking karma, so I always find something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> parking karma. I don't know how to drive, so I have no answer. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think it, close. Uh, what? What? Fine lines. lines. Okay, you have fine lines. Okay. Anyone else want to take a stab? It's really one word. It's hope. <laughs> There's no system for parking in any place on the planet, right? There's none. So uh, none. And what does it do? It's, it, it, it creates something called circuity. Circuity is a, a kind of a, a massive effect in transportation. It's about 35 to 45 percent of the entire energy suck goes to circuity. That's not knowing where you're going, that's looking for parking, that's stuck in traffic, that's an 18-wheeler in Texas going down the wrong ramp, has to drive 15 miles to get back and then another 15 miles to be back to wherever you need to go in the first place. It's not being intelligent, actually. So that's what, what happens when you guess when you need to park. So what if the city had, had half a brain, or a brain you know, dumber than a horse, right? where there's a parking meter that says, hey, I'm available. Right now, I'm available. You have a GPS system that says, oh, that parking meter is available, right? You get location, space, all together, and you go from A to B directly. Not guessing, but you know where you need to go. And you can set up a kind of financial system to that, or a, a kind of a bid system, where if you, re well, you don't drive, but if, if you wanted to park, you would pay a quarter to park there. Uh, you desperately have to get there, so you're gonna pay 50 cents, right? And then you'll get the space. But when there's no uh, demand, it's free for everyone, right? As long as there's, you know, there's a certain behavior path. Anyway, there's a million ways you can cut it, but there, you certainly need to get much more intelligent about how you think about parking. Zurich has signs, the numbers, for all the different parking lots that are underground that you can find. Yeah, yeah, it, there's um, the cities that are starting to think that way. It's a, it, in fact, I can't believe it's taking us this long to do that. Uh, this movie, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll play it here. Uh, So, so if everything is inside the wheel, that frees up the, the, the kind of the body of the car, the whole rest of the car, for, for anything it wants to be. Actually, in this case, it becomes very, very soft and has an embedded informatic here, like something like e-ink. So the car itself can set off a kind of semiotic pulse, create some kind of communication, because the entire surface of the, the body of the vehicle is, there's, there's, no, there's no junk in it. Right? It's all happening in the wheel, so it could be as lightweight, it could be nomadic, uh, any kind of system that, that wants to kind of distribute information into the city. And I should have learned how to do this before. There's no icon that you can just press on? Uh, what did you say it was? Command? Uh, press them together. P. Command. Uh, okay. okay, so so here the, the whole city takes on the same kind of affected posture, responding to any messages you want to give to your car, any kind of signal. The city also can have the same like veneer. You get the true mediated city, all, the whole city kind of responding together. This is for uh, Bronzeville in Chicago. I had a project there. This was uh, celebrating Black History Month. Uh, and then, then the kind of the, the vehicle itself, actually the body is made up of these pneumatic quilts, ETFD foil pneumatic quilts, super soft, opening up points of aperture. So it can trace the driver's view wherever the driver looks. It opens up a space. The driver's not looking and can kind of close it off. Hey, Mitchell, just as a little heads up, um, lunch is from 1 to 2. So we, um, can we what, just like save the spot where you're going to talk and then we'll reconvene later because uh, people Are we on lunch right now? Yeah, we're, we're, we're cutting it up right now. Yeah. Uh, but um, we come back at 4. Yeah, we, and then we come back at 4 in the same space, same time. Oh, same. Or the same. You know, so okay, that's uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it on uh, naked cars. <laughs> and, um, one thing I definitely want to nudge everybody is to keep it as a dialogue form. I know both of us tend to get into our flow of things, but the idea is that it's a Socratic process, and I want to encourage people in this course to kind of get, I think everyone gets a more rich experience if you stop and ask questions, and if there's something you're interested in, feel free to just, you know, just uh, maybe wave your hand and ask a question. 
you know, maybe we'll get some sparks going that way as well. Um, so we'll see you guys in a couple hours.